This is the largest arms market in Pakistan. We're on the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan, 10 minutes before our crew gets the attention of the tribal police. This tribal area is also called Trouble Area. The official laws of Pakistan don't work here. It harbors a marketplace where you can buy anything normally never sold at any other regular market of the world. Although, at first glance, it looks pretty regular too. We spot some creepy hearse vans at the entrance, then see a number of guys selling veggies off their trucks. All seems pretty ordinary until, behind the peas, cucumbers, and old scales, we see a wall with a banner, Asia Arms Store, complete with phone numbers and a contact in WhatsApp. As soon as we entered the market, we were followed, and five minutes later, we were stopped by two big guys in black. One did the talking, while the other kept tightening his tactical vest, as if getting ready for action. He had an AFK rifle on his shoulder, and he just kept touching it. Understand they want us to leave. What are they saying? They say we need a permission. They say it's not allowed. People, today we will show you active gun-making factories in Pakistan. We will go to the tribal areas that are out of reach of the official government. Today, we have with us Alex Pototsky, a friend of mine and a fantastic reporter who's been all over the world. My name is Alex Pototsky. I'm a roving reporter. Right now, I'm in Pakistan on a special reporting assignment for The People Channel. Are you subscribed to our channel? Not yet? The sad thing is that Anton can't go on his next adventure until you do. So pretty please, subscribe now. That's right, go ahead, click subscribe. Well done and thank you. We can continue now. Our goal is to get here, this area in between Pakistan and Afghanistan that counts as one of the most dangerous in the world, and I totally mean it, one US president said so himself. When Barack Obama was the US president, he called this place the most dangerous in the world. For the American people, this border region has become the most dangerous place in the world. But you understand that these guys don't see the difference between American, French, Russian, or whatever. We are all the same to them, which is why this area is off limits to all reporters and bloggers. Any foreigner with a camera is a walking mark for terrorists. Our crew flew from Moscow to the city of Lahore in Pakistan, and then took a train to Peshawar, the last city on the way from the government-controlled area to the tribal area. There's no early train ticket sale here, so we had to arrive an hour or a bit less before the train is scheduled to leave to buy our ride. Just There, they met Ishrat. He is an interpreter, but he is also a key asset because he knows people who can help us get into the federally administered tribal areas. That's the official name of the area on the border with Afghanistan. There's no guarantee the mission will be a success because it's a place where people manufacture and sell arms and other forbidden things, and no one likes any strangers showing up there. We wanted to buy the best seats in the car with an air conditioner, but those were already sold out even though I can't really see how that's possible, given they don't sell tickets in advance here. Look, they've got anti-tank hedgehogs with barbed wire installed around the train station, but no one checks people going in or out of the building itself. There are no security gates with metal detectors or scanners of any kind. The station is exceptionally huge and has a distinct local flavor. Here, for example, is a kiosk that sells snacks and coke, as well as some cotton rags to wipe sweat and plastic hand fans. Instead of a regular announcement, your train is arriving on track two, the speed speakers went on to broadcast a call for prayer. Oh, 
Some guys are working unloading big boxes onto wooden carts they have to push and pull in pairs because it's way too heavy for one man. The train was getting late and the locals clearly enjoyed posing for our camera. These two guys sat so still they were almost not breathing. How are you? Check out these two, they turned around and walked on camera. One is twirling his moustache like a model no less. Finally, our train arrives. 15 minutes late, or rather 45 minutes late because it was due at 7.30. People are getting on and off the train while it's going, hanging onto the handrails. As it turns out, the way it works here is first you need to get into the car by any manner possible and then figure out the seating situation. This train is a real mess. If you expect, you know, a train attendant to check your tickets before you can take your assigned seat, nothing like this happens here. Everyone is forcing their way into whatever car they can squeeze themselves into. Imagine the most awful cheap fare train you've ever seen, and then imagine it's two times worse. That'll be the train our crew had to ride all night. Finally, there was a free seat, but then some guy showed up out of nowhere claiming it was his. Then the lights went off. This is so bad. No lights, no fresh air, no ventilation, no bloody anything. I have no idea where to go and what to do about it. And you probably can't even see me right now either. In the end, the guys found out that there were no free seats on the train, but many people were due to get off in a couple of hours. Anyway, I found the best place on this train and the absolute best way to chill. The thing is that no one bothers much about safety on trains in Pakistan, so you can simply open a train door and sit on the ledge enjoying a cool breeze as you're watching the scenery. Look, I've got company. Ishrat stayed inside to guard our luggage. The train attendant promised us seats in the sleeping car and I hope we'll have a good night's sleep when we get there. Let me tell you why we decided to try and get into the Fata to start with. Pakistan's tribal areas are the holy grail of any reporter. Dara Adam Kel, the main town of the frontier region Kohat, is known for its markets, where you can buy absolutely all sorts of arms, from handguns to anti-aircraft guns capable of shooting down aeroplanes. Numerous checkpoints are guarding the entrance to Fata, manned by Pakistani military who check every vehicle and intercept all foreigners. The territory beyond these checkpoints is controlled by the so-called tribal police that is formally administered by the central government but in fact runs things the way it sees fit. Any foreigner with a camera will be arrested and brought to a police station for their own protection. No foreigner has ever been able to make it beyond Peshawar, the last city on the government-controlled territory on the way to the tribal areas. And then there's another serious threat, the Taliban, which is a terrorist organization. These guys can kidnap foreigners in broad daylight to demand ransom or just for sport. And so we are in Peshawar. I woke up about half an hour ago, had to get some sleep after our train ride. And now we're already on our way to an arms market. Uh, our local contact, Ijaz, picked up the guys. He studied in Russia many years ago and can even speak some Russian, but I'll tell you about him later. Right now, the guys are on their way to meet his cousin. We're on our way to meet some relatives of Ijaz who are in the arms business. The taxi stopped outside of the city where another transport was already waiting. We are now switching cars. Our ride will be the legendary Toyota Land Cruiser 80 series. That's so badass cool. Shukriya. 
I don't have any clear idea of where we're going or how, but I'm sure it will be thrilling. At first, everything looked pretty ordinary. Some industrial looking area, a tall chimney of a brick making factory, some roadside sales of gates and doors, and a park of heavily loaded trucks that looked like little cargo airplanes. Then came the first checkpoints, and Alex had to hide his camera. Right now, we've cleared one of the checkpoints. To get through, I have to hide my camera and wear my best poker face. Because, you know, I'm trying to get by the military guys who know that guys like me are not allowed to go through. Alex, hide it! Right, hiding my camera. What do you say to them? that I'm Pashtun? <laughs> one officer wanted to stop us, but our driver told him that I'm Pashtun. Well, I guess I could pass for one. Pashtuns are a local tribe that traditionally manufactures and carries arms. In this area, everyone has guns. Many guns, and no one knows how many exactly. Official numbers say that people have 6 million registered firearms in their possession, and unofficially, 44 million. That's a quarter of Pakistan's entire population. To avoid further checks, our car went off the main road, while Alex simply fell asleep. This is totally ridiculous, and you might not even believe me, but I actually slept through the whole thing. We are no longer in Peshawar. We are already in the federally administered tribal areas where no foreigners are allowed. We have already crossed the border. And we are on our way not to just some arms market, but to the legendary arms market in Dara Adar Mikel, the historic center of gunsmithing and weapons trade in the region. See these mountains? That's where Afghanistan begins. As you know, in 2021, the Taliban seized power in the country. That's when the remaining US troops were urgently evacuating, and the locals who had collaborated with the Americans were ready to cling onto aircraft wheels in order to leave the country. The Taliban is an Islamic fundamentalist and nationalist militant political movement, which is outlawed by many countries as a terrorist organization. This area here is in fact the birthplace of the Taliban. And so it still poses a serious threat, both for the locals and any stray foreigners who dare show up here. Another thing I want to say is that this place is truly gorgeous. They have amazing lush green mountains and, pardon my French, I can't help it, I'm fucking shocked at how beautiful it is. I'm fucking shocked. I fell asleep and woke up in the tribal areas. I'm stunned. I have no words. By the way, until that moment, Alex had made three attempts to get into the local tribal areas and failed every time. This is the market where it all started. The arms market. Are we in Dara Adam Kell already? Yes, it's Dara Adam Kell and the arms market. Right, so we've arrived at the legendary arms market, which so far looks like a pretty ordinary market. That is, people sell bananas here, clothes. But soon we'll see what this marketplace is famous for. Fuck me, I still can't believe it. All these people, this way or another, are involved in the arms trade. At first glance, you couldn't really say that we are in some special place in Pakistan. But now we're walking past these shops and look, there's an arms store. Assalamu alaikum. So, on the one hand, it looks like ordinary Pakistan, but in truth, it's the Pakistan that is closed for everyone. I'm still trying to wrap my head around the fact that I've actually made it to this legendary place. So, here we just keep walking and see people selling guns, but they told us no camera, so okay, we keep on moving. Here's another gun store. And then the trouble started. We came looking for guns, and guns came to us, in the hands of the tribal police patrolling the market. This guy seemed pretty eager to show us how his AK rifle works. Two reassuring factors were that some kids were still hanging around, and the guys talked in a pretty relaxed manner. 
They say we need a permission. It's not allowed to shoot the stores on camera and show them because it's dangerous. Uh, okay, dangerous. I, I get it. And if we just walk around without shooting? So we can't even walk around without a permission? Without permission, you can't. I can't believe it that I'm here. <laughs> Imagine how stunned I am that I'm here. Never expected to see such a place today, let alone shoot something. The policeman who talked to us explained everything, and it's pretty simple. There's no problem being in the market, he has no problem with us. But there's one big problem. The Taliban. Because these guys are active in the area and come to the market to buy guns too. It's the Pakistani branch of the Taliban that he's talking about. They've not been able to seize power like in Afghanistan, but they're trying to. And he said that if the guys from the Taliban show up and see us, he'll have problems. Basically, we will all have problems then. Big problems. And no one wants that. So, unless we have a permission, and once again I feel like I'm in some sort of spy action movie. And then it did turn into a real spy movie. The guys jumped into the car, left the city, and spent some time making sure no one was following them. It seemed like they were in the clear. And then it turned out that one of the guys accompanying our crew was no ordinary guy. In fact, he is an arms dealer. And he volunteered to show us his gun factory. And guess who? It was the driver, with a big smile. So, right over there, there's an arms manufacturing facility where they make ammo. To get there, our crew had to go off the main road and drive through some bushes until we bumped into a tall, massive fence with a reinforced gate. Guys, if you like my video and if you like what we're doing, I would really appreciate if you support us on Patreon, on Pioneer or on PayPal. And we try to make even more great films from a new dangerous places for you. Thank you. All the links are in the description. Please donate. So, we have arrived at an arms factory located in the tribal areas of Pakistan where no foreigners are allowed to go, to be seen around, or even to talk about going there. This is, without exaggeration, unique footage we're giving you. You can hear the power generator making noise because this area has no centralized supply of electricity. Outside, they're drying gunpowder spread over a number of beds. Check out an AK rifle by the entrance. It's obviously there, not just for show. See how they've used duct tape to put two magazines together? That helps them switch faster. The rounds are produced right here at this very facility. You could literally call this place an ammo second-hand store. This man here is breaking down used rounds into parts that will be reused to make new ones. They will stuff the cases with gunpowder, insert the bullets, primer, and everything around consists of. This facility, as it turned out, is relatively small. Their whole production fits in this wing. They also seem to be making some kind of other things, because they forbade our crew to film some of the tools they have. Why can't we film this tool? What does it do? I, I don't know. Some secret production? Yes, yes, yes. What's in these barrels? In those barrels over there? I don't know, I don't know. Only this and that. This... Don't... Okay, okay, I get it, I get it. No barrels on camera. Yes, yes, yes. There's also a sharp smell of some thinner or solvent, you know? So, you probably have guessed what they use the barrels for. I won't say it out loud. And this is where these guys live, who work here making rounds, guns, and lots of other things. To be honest, that's when things started to feel really dicey. The factory set up in the grey area for a reason. Obviously, they make more than just regular ammo here. Most likely, some illegal stuff. There's no other reason they would set up shop here instead of Peshawar, because Peshawar also has lots of government-licensed gun-making factories where people work officially. Wait, what? That's right, you heard me right. Government allows gun making. People in Pakistan have always been making guns, so the government figured it's best to allow it and keep it under control. That's how they control the sales of weapons, and know who bought what gun and collect taxes while at it. And so the government started licensing gun makers and encouraging them to move out of the grey zone of the tribal areas. 
Now, we're arriving at a gun-making factory in Peshawar. It's probably the largest one here. On both sides, we can see banners with names of all these gunsmiths making AK rifles, TT and Marakov pistols, even Italian Beretta pistols. Only, naturally, they are not Italian, they are made in Pakistan. It's important to understand that all these guns they make in Pakistan are counterfeit guns. You know, like in China, they used to produce tons of fake Adidas sneakers called Abibas or counterfeit luxury brand items emulating Dolce & Gabbana. Well, today, Pakistan is the world's number one hub for bootleg gun manufacturing. This factory is 150 years old. It's a family business that I inherited from my ancestors. Our family has been in the gun-making business longer than the Republic of Pakistan exists. Our business is legal and the government has issued me a license. We make guns and report to the government all our sales, like who bought what. I pay my taxes and can work in peace. No one gives me any trouble. I am happy that I work in Peshawar and that people who had no work can come here and work and get paid. This is Harun. He's an arms dealer, and he has the luxury of peacefully talking about his business like it's some wheat trade. I've got clients in different cities of Pakistan and India. I have more than enough. I also get orders from abroad, especially from Africa. I sell my guns to South Africa, Zimbabwe, and to other countries. I also sell to Asia and Europe. So, a gun factory here is essentially a number of workshops where gunsmiths make parts and assemble handguns, assault rifles, and also make ammo. In this workshop that I've just walked into, they have some machine tools. I guess they're making pistol frames here by the look of it. There are no assembly lines here. Everything is handcrafted. Any pistol is made up of a number of parts, and right here you can see how they're making one of those parts. Once these parts are ready, these guys hand them over to workers in other workshops for further processing. They have a courtyard that's used as a parking lot for motorbikes, with galleries around that have dozens of rooms with no doors. These are all workshops, and men are making guns here, sitting right on the ground. I am a master gunsmith. I've got assistants. My team can make 35 pistols per month. Pistols of any kind, like Glocks, Soviet TT pistols. Right now, I've got a Beretta pistol in my hands. And these are no toys. They are real operational guns. Look at this guy checking the sliding mechanism. As for the equipment, it's pretty basic. All I can see here is a vice and some regular tools lying around among the gun parts. Every gunsmith has an opinion of his own. I believe that one has to be very good with a file. You have to improve your filing technique day after day. And you have to be good with a hammer. Your strikes must be powerful and balanced. And of course, you need a good eye. Did you hear him? A hammer and a file. And there are some drills to drill holes in the workshop. It's absolutely unbelievable how they can make anything operational in such conditions. Now it's like this, and then it will be like this. Uh-huh. First, they make a metal frame. A frame? Yes, yes. Right, I see. Out of this, they make this. Can you hear it? This is how they test the guns they've made here. The buyers test the guns too. They have one rule here. Check whatever you buy when you buy it. So if you buy a gun here and some rounds, here you go, you can use a special room to test your purchase and see how it goes. Check out the walls in this place. Quite obviously, they test their guns not only in a special room, but right where they're working. And they have loads of ready guns just lying around. For example, here, you can see open boxes with guns that are ready for sale stacked on the floor. You know, another thing that keeps amazing me every time I meet people who make all kinds of guns here, the thing that I find amazing is that all of them are very friendly and nice people. They are nice to you, they keep smiling, making jokes. There's no aggression at all. They don't really fit the stereotype of someone who is in the arms business, you know? If you don't know what these guys are making, all this looks like an ordinary small business. Look at them having a lunch break. 
They put a carpet on top of everything they were doing to sit on it and have a bite. And after lunch, they have a bit of free time to do some surfing and scrolling. While in the room next door, the lunch is over. We are now in the painting shop where they paint pistol parts. Many of the guns are pre-ordered and you can have them in any color you like, gold, black or pink, if you wish. The customer chooses the color to their liking. So all these gun parts have been painted and are now drying. I bet no one has heard about labor safety here. Look at this guy spraying paint on some gun parts with no mask on. He's basically breathing in the paint. It's also amazing how well made these pistols and guns look when they're ready, just like the factory manufactured originals. They even got the writing on this one. Hartford, Connecticut, USA. <laughs> but in reality, Everything here is made in Pakistan. Then there's another room where they store guns. There are so many of them, you can't see the walls. There are rows and rows of guns and rifles. And if you look carefully, this stuff looks more like it belongs in a museum than a gun factory. I think pistols like this one were probably used around the time of Duma's Three Musketeers. There's a practice in Pakistan of police confiscating all the weapons from any terrorist or drug traffickers they arrest, and then auctioning all these seized weapons off to gun factories like this one. The factories have master gunsmiths who can fix them and restore them, and then they sell them again. As you can see, all the guns here are very old, in poor condition. But here they have this master gunsmith who is the best here. And he can take any of these guns and make it like new. And it will work again. You probably noticed that there are quite a lot of kids at the factory. Boys only, of course. We spotted one on the staircase. Another one was cooking. Then we looked into another shop and look, this little guy is at most 12. But he is already working with his father and making a pistol. His father told us that he comes here after school to work. Obviously, there are no specialized schools for gunsmiths here, and since being a gunsmith pays well in Pakistan, fathers teach their sons from generation to generation. That's how people have been living here for hundreds of years. I've got a land, a house, a family, kids. I'm a happy man. When my sons grow up, I will bring them here and teach them to make guns. I will teach them all the secrets of my trade. The owner of this factory said that he grew up here, and pistols and guns were his toys. All my ancestors made guns in the tribal areas. My father, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather. Pashtuns consider guns men's best decoration, not a murder weapon. Pashtuns are very hospitable, and there are no thieves here. Take a look at any bank here, and you will see no guards. You can carry around a million dollars in a bag, and no one will rob you. But every house has guns. Many guns. Please tell the world that Pashtuns are a peaceful and hospitable nation. Of course, the guns made here can't compare in quality to the original weapons, but the demand is through the roof. This is the factory store right across the road. A locally made Glock costs $100, while the original Glock costs at least $700. A copy of the Russian TT pistol costs $50. Imagine a Tula Tukarov for $50. I bet in Tula this money could only buy you a toy gun. Also, $50 bucks can buy you here a shotgun like this, and 100 bucks will buy you a hybrid automatic rifle. It's part Kalashnikov part M16, courtesy of local gunsmiths. It's like a shop on any other street. They can make you tea here and sell you any weapon of choice. The key thing here is to have a license, but it's very easy to get. Also, you need to win the seller's heart. I vet every man who wants to buy a gun from me. First, they need a license, but I also ask why he wants a gun. There have been cases when I saw that the guy was a thief or a killer or some thug. I feel such things, then I say no. I'm not selling a gun to you, that's my final word. The craziest thing is that if these men had no jobs, they would highly likely end up taking arms and joining some Taliban group. But they do have jobs now, so making guns is the cost they're paying for living a peaceful life.